Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The problem this morning is we have a problem of plenty, and thank you for making that problem for us. We are absolutely overwhelmed at the tremendous response that the Bengal Chamber Agium for 2018 has generated from you all. We are humbled. We shall commence our uh, you know, session today with a very special talk by Dr. Ashok V. Desai, eminent economist and former chief consultant with the Ministry of Finance, Government of India. The discussion topic of federalism in an open economy, balancing economic governance with political governance, will be introduced and moderated by Sri Shunil Mitra, former Revenue and Finance Secretary, Government of India, and chairperson of the Bengal Chamber's Economic Affairs Committee. The reason why we you know, thought that this will be a good way to you know, kickstart this uh, coming year for us is because we are all living in very interesting times where domestic and international dynamics are always intertwined. Governance is essentially related to politics in that politics is often defined as the art of governance. And perhaps the notion of economic governance and political governance cannot be disassociated from one another. May I now request Ms. Shunil Mitro to please take this session forward. Sir. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, let me echo Shubhadeep's uh, short mention of thanks to all of you who have come in, in uh, it's the first time that I'm seeing the hall in a preparatory to the AGM session, full. And I have seen this hall over many years. And I, I, I would like to join him in adding my thanks. Uh, <clears throat> both uh, outgoing and incoming presidents of the chamber, members, guests, Dr. Desai, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Welcome to the AGM 2018 of the Chamber of Commerce and Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. We have established a practice of prefacing the AGM with a thought-provoking discussion on a subject of contemporary relevance set in the context of the economic betterment of the Eastern region. This is catalyzed in recent years by a talk by an eminent thinker of the country and sets the tone for our research and advisories to our constituents state governments, and other stakeholders during the course of the year. Shubhadeep has mentioned the subject that we have set for this year. It's, uh, as he has said, and I will recount, I don't, I don't see it up here, so I will recount it. It's federalism in an open economy, building economic, balancing economic with political governance. It is our privilege to have with us a member of the national team that brought about the momentous changes to open our economy, to set the tone for our AGM this year. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ashok Desai. Dr. Desai is an economist and consultant with extensive Indian and international experience. He is a consultant editor of The Telegraph, a leading English language newspaper in this part of the country, and a columnist with Business World, a business magazine. He is one of India's most widely read business writers. He was chief economic advisor 
to the government of India from 1991 to 93, when he helped Dr. Manmohan Singh with the reforms and reversed our old socialist policies. His reflections on the reforms led to his book, My Economic Affair Between 1998 and 99. Dr. Desai also served as member, Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council under Prime Minister Vajpayee. In the 1980s, Dr. Desai coordinated a large survey of energy research for the International Development Center in Ottawa. In the 1970s, Dr. Desai taught and researched at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji, as well as the University of Sussex in England. Earlier, he worked as an economist in National Council of Applied Economic Research in Delhi, where he carried out policy-oriented industri industrial studies, especially studies on technology development and transfer. Dr. Desai has also advised Indian and international organizations, including World Bank, UNCTAD, and OECD Development Center. Dr. Desai has also served as consultant, research and planning division, economic commission for Asia and the Far East in Bangkok, where he contributed to work on manpower problems. Although he lives in India, Dr. Desai has ranged far. He studied economics in Cambridge, taught in Oxford, Bombay, Delhi, and Suva in Fiji, did research in Berlin and Brighton, and ran an energy project in Ottawa. In his address to us today morning, Dr. Desai will briefly comment upon aspects of governance and examine an hitherto unexplored aspect of federalism that has strong economic implications for Eastern India. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my privilege to, do, to request Dr. Desai to address us. Thank you, Mr. Mitra, for that very nice introduction. Um, I was really delighted to receive your invitation from Bengal Chamber. And I said yes without hesitation, because I am no stranger to Calcutta. Ena, my wife, is from your city. And since South City was built, I've had a flat there. And I spend some months every year in Calcutta so that Ena can visit her friends. I also used to look forward to great intellectual rows in Calcutta, because my friends here like to argue. And since I was a rightist, I provoked their argumentative instincts. Unfortunately, most of them have grown too old, died, or given, given up on me as irreconcilable, redeemable. But it's still fun to listen to a full-blooded debate in Calcutta. It is a long time since I have been to Bengal Chamber a visit I do remember was in 1992 or 1993, when economic reforms were still new and unfamiliar, and I tra used to travel a good deal to explain them and why we were shaking up the foundations of economic policy. Reforms are old and forgotten today, but I'm proud of the fact that while India had an economic crisis at least once every 10 years, up to 1991, we have, we have had none since then. That is due to the liberalization of the balance of payments and fiscal correction that we began in 1991. I'm no longer sure that the end of crisis is such a good thing because the strength of the economy means that even an idiot can run it nowadays. There has been no lack of idiocy in recent years. Demonetization, the poorly designed goods and services tax, the ineffective steps against black money, these are major examples. What is worse, idiotic economic policies may continue beyond 2019 uh, because they will not be punished by political defeat in the next general election. election 
as is supposed to happen in democracies. Nationally, the ruling party faces no competition and may return to power next year. And although our country abounds in legislatures, there are two at the center, a couple of dozen in the states, and hundreds further down. None of them serves its basic function, which is rational debate over policies before they are made or implemented. Democracy gives employment to thousands in India and has been extremely lucrative for some of them. But the quality of governance it gives us is nothing to be proud of. I became ac acutely aware of this when I was in government. I remember coming to Calcutta in 1992 with the finance minister. He'd been challenged to a public debate by the chief minister, Jyoti Basu. And as we got close to the Indian Institute of Management, where the debate was going to be held, we encountered demonstrators holding placards against reforms and shouting slogans at us. Some of them even rushed at the car and tried to attack us, but we had a good driver and we got away. When we arrived at the meeting, the chief minister asked Manmohan Singh to speak first. I had written a speech for him, which he had read on the flight, but he just put it aside and in the meeting he spoke extempore. After he finished, Jyoti Basu said, you spoke so well that maybe someday you'll convince even us. <laughs> Sadly, the passion did not last, survive for long. The reforms were extremely unpopular, especially among owners of industries whose protection from imports we had reduced. The finance minister used to get hurt by criticism. I remember Atal Bihari Vajpayee telling him in parliament, Mr. Finance Minister, thicken your skin. Unfortunately, skin is not thickened easily. I had lots of ideas for reforms. I kept writing them up in files and sending them to him. I had made a thoughtful plan to reduce import duties, for example. But being new to government, I felt that I, it had to have the comments of the customs. So I sent the file through the Chief Com Commissioner of Customs. The Chief Commissioner, an old corrupt customs officer, was so shocked by what I had proposed that he locked up the file. Manmohan Singh himself was so harassed by my endless reform proposals that he kept, kicked me upstairs and brought in a less passionate Chief Economic Advisor. Three years later, Long after I left, Shukumar Mukhopadhyay became the Chief Commissioner of Customs. He found my file and implemented the duty redu reductions. Let me give you another example to illustrate how things get done in the government and why they do not get done. The import of gold was banned by the government of British India in 1939 at the beginning of the Second World War. It was still banned in 1991. Now, Indians cannot do without gold. How can there be a wedding without gold bangles, earrings, necklaces? So a minor Bombay businessman realized this and worked out a, an excellent business model. After the oil crisis in the 1970s, uh, Dubai prospered and attracted lakhs of Malayalis to work as clerks and housemaids. They sent money to their wives and parents in Kerala. They would go to a, a pay a bank in Dubai. The bank would transfer money to another bank, and so on until it got to, a, got to a bank which had a branch close to their wife in Kerala. She would get it eventually after some days or weeks, and the cost of sending money to her was very high. Daud, went to Malayali workers and said, give me the money. I promise that your wife in Kerala will get it day after tomorrow. He would take the dirhams and buy gold with them. He would load it onto fast boats. They would race across Arabian Sea 
and landed on India's west coast in ports where he had bribed the customs officials. From these ports, it would be sent all over India and sold at three times its cost in Dubai. A third of it was deliver delivered to the Malayali workers, wives and parents. The cost of the entire operation came to perhaps 10% and the rest was all profit for Daud. Ghoul smuggling was the most lucrative business in India. One day in the finance ministry, a furtive Indian trader from Dubai came to see me and told me this story. So I went to the finance minister and said, let us allow free gold imports and ask our banks to open branches in Dubai. If they do that, Dawood's smuggling operation will collapse and he'll have no use for the dirhams that he is buying from Indian workers in Dubai. They'll go to the nearest Indian bank and send the money home through it. The foreign exchange they send will be more than enough to finance the gold imports. So there is no net cost in foreign exchange. The finance minister said, oh, I don't think I can do it. It's too risky and did nothing. But I had given the same idea to the commerce minister, Chidambaram. He became finance minister in 1998 and did what I had suggested. All the gold Indians wanted to came in, wanted, came in legally and Dawood's business collapsed. His misfortune lasted until Pranab Mukherjee increased import duty from 2 to 4% in 2012. Mukherjee was relatively modest, but the present finance minister raised the duty to 10% and made smuggling profitable again. Let me now come to the central subject of our meeting today, namely federalism. This issue has been raised many times in Parliament, but the term was first used by the Prime Minister in his speech on 11th of June 9, 2015. He said he believed in cooperative federalism and did not think that the centre should be a big brother to states. He was happy to see healthy competition in development between, between states. He said that states should emulate the best practices in other states and as he, as he had tried to do when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat. Shogoto Bose followed the Chief Prime Minister with his maiden speech and welcomed his promise of fiscal federalism. He then said, that the centre was siphoning off much, much of West Bengal's revenue as interest on its debt that violated the spirit of cooperative federalism. Shogata Bose had probably got the concept from his other country, namely the United States, which also has a federal constitution like India. In fact, as its name implies, the states in the US came before the United States of America. After Christopher Columbus discovered America, Europeans started coming to the East Coast and formed colonies. These colonies came together in the 1760s because they objected to the arbitrary, arbitrary taxes imposed by His Majesty's government. They had no experience of or precedence in working together and made a number of mistakes. They first met in 70, 1774 simply to coordinate their opposition to taxes, but once they rose in rebellion, they found that certain things had to be done and could not be done separately by each state. They had to have a common army to fight the King of England. So George Washington was made the commander. The Union government had to have revenue. It had inherited an enormous debt, just like the government of West Bengal, arising from a costly war. The debt had to be serviced. So they gave the union government revenue from import duties and power to tax a few commodities. They had to have common currency to replace the pound. At that time, silver was being mi mined 
in Mexico, Colombia, and elsewhere in Latin America. And there were silver currencies floating all around the Atlantic, most of them called pesos and talas. Tala was originally the name of a coin introduced in Bohemia in 1519 from silver found in Joachim's Tal, or the Valley of Joachim in Germany. <clears throat> so when they had to current, create a currency other than the British pound, the colonies called it the dollar. In this way, the Union of Federation of States took place step by step over 20 years. May I please request everyone to switch off their phones. Um, it was controlled by rules negotiated among the states themselves, and that took the shape of the US Constitution. In our own times, a federation has taken shape before our eyes in Europe. It began with the formation of the European Coal and Steel Community by six countries in 1951 and has grown into the European Union of 28 countries. It has slowly assumed powers exercised by member countries, but the co countries retain their own governments, parliaments, and judicial systems, and the decisions of the Union authorities have to be approved by national authorities. That is a slow and uncertain process and has sometimes led to tensions and conflicts among member nations. The latest conflict on movement of citizens across member states has led the United Kingdom to leave the Union. It will take years to negotiate Brexit and Britain may still get too tired and stay. Our constitution makers anticipated the competition between the center and the states for resources and provided a solution in the form of finance commissions every five years. The 15th Finance Commission is sitting just now and is expected to submit its report in the next year. It consists of two Singhs and one Das. Das was earlier finance secretary. Anup Singh teaches in Georgetown University and presumably commutes from there. N.K. Singh is a magician or a racketeer, depending on your point of view. <laughs> he was Joint Secretary in the Finance Ministry in the early 1990s when I was Chief Consultant. When Manmohan Singh had to get something done, which he could not or would not do, he would ask N.K. N.K. rose to be officer on special duty to PM Narsimha when BJP came to power, Vajpayee appointed him in the Planning Commission, and then he jumped ship and became Rajya Sabha member, representing Nitish Kumar's BJD. In 2014, he jumped ship again and was made chairman of the 15th Finance Commission by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. My point in recounting this history is that NK is great at making friends and serving masters. The West Bengal government should be nice to him. If it makes friends with him, he will steer the Finance Commission towards West Bengal's interest. What are those interests? I would pick out a few. The first is West Bengal's enormous debt burden and the consequent interest that it has to fork out out of its budget every year. The ratio of debt to state domestic product for West Bengal in 2016-17 was 34.1%. By 2018-19, it had risen to 37.6%. The share of debt servicing in expenditure was 23.4% in 2016-17. By 2018, it had risen to 24.2%. In other words, West Bengal is getting more indebted every year. It is borrowing more than it needs even to repay its debt. The Chief Minister has blamed the previous CPM government for the reckless borrowings. On facts, she is right. But however much she blames CPM, 
CPM will not repay the debts it incurred, nor will the center forgive or write off the debt. The government should work on the variables that are under its control. These variables are expenditure and revenue. I find that the government has chosen new areas to spend on in the past two years. Urban development and urban police have traditionally been funded by every city out of its own revenue. West Bengal has started spending on them out of the state budget. Women and children are another new expenditure item. I'm sure they deserve the expenditure but did the government have to start new programs for them when it is in such financial straits? Coming to revenue, West Bengal's own tax revenue is just about a quarter of its total expenditure. Surely that's rather low. All states together collect roughly 7% of the STP in taxes. West Bengal collects only 5%. And actual collections are 10% lower than budget estimates. Is that because the finance minister is an incurable optimist? Or because revenue is lost in bribes taken by those who are supposed to collect it? If West Bengal closed this tab and raised the tax SDP ratio to 8%, its borrowings count would come down by more than a half. And if then it then cut total expenditure by 10%, it would be in surplus. Now let me come to my main and most controversial point. Cooperative federalism can be as much between countries as between states. China has been creating links between itself and other countries through one belt, one road. India does not have so much money so it has to find other ways to connect with neighbors, especially Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Southeast and Southwest Asia. First, India should cre remove the red tape that SEBI has created, create an efficient capital market like that of London and Singapore, and open access to cheap capital. Second, India should expand its hospitals and make good medical services internationally available. In other words, it should export medical services. Third, it must raise academic standards to those in its best institutions, like IITs and IIMs, and open them to young people from outside. In other words, it should export education. And finally, it must ask, what would best serve the interests of each of its neighbors and do those things. Let me take the case of Bangladesh. I think India should remove all restrictions on the movement of goods as well as people between India and Bangladesh. India is the sec world's second most populous country and third in terms of gross domestic product at purchasing power parity. It is number 11 in terms of nominal GDP because its prices are much lower than the world average. It used to be quite a closed economy, but after the 1991 reforms, it opened up. Today, its rank in terms of exports and imports is not much behind its rank in terms of nominal GDP. In other words, it's a fairly open country as far as trade is concerned. It receives proportionally less foreign direct investment. Its rank in this respect is much below. Its rank in other aggregates, but it doesn't matter very much. Bangladesh, being a smaller country, may be expected to be more open. In general, if you look at the world, big countries like um, India, US, Brazil, are relatively more close. Their trade to GDP ratios are lower. Small countries are more open, their trade to GDP ratios are higher, but Bangladeshis are not. The ratios of its trade to nominal GDP are not much higher than India's, and the ratio of FDI, foreign direct investment, received is very much lower. 
The impression that it is not more open is also confirmed by its rankings. There is something about its location in South Asia that makes Bangladesh less open. What is it? It is India. Bangladesh is far away from the big markets of the world, China and Japan in the east, EU and the US in the west. The only way it can reach a high trade to GDP ratio is by trading with its big neighbor. Consider other small countries in the same position. The US accounts for over three quarters of the exports of Canada and Mexico and roughly half their exports, half their imports. The EU accounts for over three quarters of the exports and over half the imports of Poland or the Netherlands. Both the e US and the EU account for a larger proportion of the neighbor's exports than imports. In other words, big countries are big markets for the neighbors. India is just the reverse. It accounts for tiny shares of the neighbor's trade and is more a supplier to them than a market. The US and EU are the world's biggest economies and their size may partly account for their dominance, but take South Africa, which is more comparable to India. It accounts for a third of Namibia's exports and two thirds of its imports, and for a fifth of Mozambique's exports and a third of its imports. India accounts for much less of the trade of Bangladesh. It accounts for 1.7% of Bangladesh's exports and 14% of its imports. What explains the fact that India's trade with Bangladesh accounts for a much smaller share of its neighbors than is normal for big countries? It is India that is responsible. It has impo imposed import restrictions on Bangladesh's principal exports. As a result, Bangladesh has to find markets in distant lands such as US and Japan. The restrictions, restrictions are generally administ administrative. Under SAPTA and SAFTA, India has granted duty reductions on many tariff lines. But to qualify for those duty reductions, Bangladeshi exporters have to satisfy country of origin requirements, which bring, bring them into the clutches of Indian customs. India is no more generous towards its own exports. It has an elaborate import replenishment scheme for its exports, but the document it requires can be obtained at only about a dozen points on the Indo-Bangladesh chamber where trade is allowed. In other words, if an Indian exports to Bangladesh through any other place on land, it cannot get import replenishment for its exports. So India ex discourages value-added exports to Bangladesh. India's average import duties are 7.5% and bring just 11% of central revenue. They can easily be abolished. That would free foreign trade of all this obnoxious red tape. It would be bad for corrupt customs officials, but it would be good for the country. Another major export barrier is foreign exchange. If Bangladesh were just another state of India, traders would get together in border towns and buy or sell goods. They would either give checks or cash in payment. That doesn't work in the case of border trade with Bangladesh, because Reserve Bank does not allow Indians to open bank accounts in Takas or Bangladeshis to open rupee accounts. Instead, it has given 29 banks and money, chambers, chambers like money changers licenses, and they have appointed shopkeepers in Bongaon and Petrapol as agents. So in effect, the rupee taka market is a spot market on the border. There is no dematerialized market as is common with all major foreign exchange markets, and there is no futures market. For smaller transactions, the market works largely because there are many, many mostly illegal migrants from Bangladesh to India. 
who transfer earnings to Hawala networks. The Indian government has created an extremely costly infrastructure to prevent illegal immigration. The border security force shoots a few dozen Bangladeshis dead every year. But the border is so long and offers so many points of entry across rivers and forests that it is impossible to police. The entry barriers work to some extent in West Bengal because the border is well populated. The eastern borders are not, so immigration is so much easier into Assam and Manipur. This has repeatedly posed a political problem in Assam where violent locals beat up those whom they consider interlopers. What no one in the government is prepared to recognize is that illegal immigrants are a fiction created by the government of India. It treats the Bangladeshis as foreigners like Pakistanis, instead of as permissible aliens like Nepalis. So Nepalis in Bangalore are left alone. Bangladeshis in Bangalore are treated as illegal immigrants and hounded. The government of India simply has not got the resources to stop migration, nor is anyone, official or non-official, prepared to ask why migration occurs and what is wrong with it. Bangladeshis migrate to India for precisely the same reasons as Biharis migrate to Punjab, Oriyas to Gujarat. I did ask that you should switch off your cell phones. So, they move, Bangladesh moved to India, just as Biharis moved to Punjab, Oriyas to Gujarat, or Tamils to Goa. People move to jobs. Bangladeshis get no unemployment benefit in India. They would not migrate if there were no jobs. Their migration becomes illegal simply because they are not given visas. If, like Nepalis, they were not required to have visas, they would spread out wherever there are jobs in India, and the problems that have appeared because of their geographic concentration in Bengal and Assam would disappear. And like Nepalis, they would go and work all over India, and if they could move easily across the border, they would go home more frequently. More of them would come as temporary or seasonal workers, and fewer would be forced to stay in India. A visa-free regime for Bangladeshi may sound shocking to many little Indians, but it is perfectly possible for even the Indian government to give visas liberally. It would then at least have a record of the migration. And if Bangladeshis could work legally in India, they would move freely across the border and become ambassadors of India. They would open bank accounts in India save money and use it to say, take goods and services across to Bangladesh. Just now, the only Bangladeshis who come to India are unskilled workers who cross the border informally. And a handful of rich Bangladeshis who come to Calcutta for medical treatment. If the government of India were more liberal with visas, other Bangladeshis would also visit India and would develop more economic and social contacts. One consequence of Indian government's allergy to illegal immigration is that although there are many rivers, distributaries of the two great rivers, Ganges and Brahmaputra, crisscrossing India and Bangladesh, there is little riverborne trade. But while government to India has, unrealist, has been unrealistically intent to control movement of people and goods across the land border, it has been more realistic about movement in inland waters. The two governments have signed successive protocols on inland water transit and trade since 2003. But this is all local traffic. There would be a, local, a radical change in the relationship if both countries could use each other's ports. 
India would like to use Dhaka and Chittagong ports to give its like landlocked northeast access to the sea. When it asked for this, Bangladesh in turn asked to be allowed to use Haldia, Paradip, and Visagapatta. There was no agreement. This issue is still unresolved. Bangladesh got access to Calcutta port in April. But Calcutta is too shallow for ocean trade. In my view, both, both sides are being stupid. Port traffic increases the income of a country. It does not matter which country the goods belong to. <coughs> Germany and Italy do not discriminate against shipments from Switzerland. South Africa does not ban shipments from Zimbabwe from its ports. Bangladesh simply cannot have a deep water port in its middle, nor can West Bengal. But both can prosper if they can use Haldia, Paradip, or Vizag. Jute and jute goods are the major exports of Bangladesh. India also produces them. India imports jute from Bangladesh when the Indian crop is low and stops imports when domestic supply is sufficient. It imposes import restrictions in great detail on jute products. What is remarkable is how arbitrarily the Indian Commerce Ministry imposes and removes trade restrictions without notice or consultation. The minute changes it makes suggest that it is under strong and possibly improper influence of Indian jute manufacturers. It is not just the Commerce Ministry. It is not just the Commerce Ministry that is responsible for the bureaucratic maze. Agricultural goods that are procured by the government for public distribution, such as food grains and sugar, must be stored in domestically produced gunny bags. So Bangladeshi bags are ineligible. A gunny bag is a gunny bag. There is no way of distinguishing an Indian. There is no way of distinguishing an Indian from a Bangladeshi gunny bag. India has sufficient foreign exchange to buy Bangladeshi gunny bags. If it buys some, Bangladesh will get more, will buy more Indian goods. The Commerce Ministry's restrictions are trivial. The only objective they serve is to make perfectly normal transactions illegal and give the Commerce Ministry something to do. Bangladesh is the world's third largest garment exporters. Garments account for 80% of its exports. The garment, garments it produces have a substantial content of Indian yarn and fabric. Although India has largely freed its imports from non-tariff barriers, it uses them to restrict other countries' access to the Indian market when it gives them duty concessions. It has kept garments on the negative list, which means that the Commerce Ministry can use them to bargain with other countries on mutual trade liberalization or to do favors. But after the introduction of goods and services tax, Bangladeshi governments have had duty-free access to Indian market and have taken a small share in it recently. Very recently, India has announced that it will give Bangladeshi students three-year visas to study in India. India is helping Bangladesh build a nuclear plant in Rupur. Two days ago, Hasina and Modi got together on video and inaugurated construction two rail links between the two countries. One will be a new one, and the other one has been defunct for 60 years. Normally, they would take decade, decades, but if Piyush Goyal remains railway minister after the general ele elections, it is possible that they'll be completed fairly quickly. This brief survey of Indo-Bangladeshi com commercial relations has avoided the anemic generalizations in which studies commissioned by the two, two governments indulge and concentrated on the serious current problems. As I mentioned in the beginning,
the relationship between the two countries is undeveloped and capable of considerable development. That will occur only if the two sides forget reciprocity and take bold, generous, unilateral measures. Unilateral favors do not give anything away. They add to the total transactions and bring the two countries closer. What I would suggest is that India throws all the finicky agreements with Bangladesh into the waste paper basket and allows free access to India to Bangladeshi people, goods and services, and that Reserve Bank lets Indian banks open branches in Bangladesh and Bangladeshi banks to open branches in India. Closer relations between the two countries are in our interests. I am sure some of you will have something to say on my controversial views, so I'll stop here. Thank you. A member of the BCC and I, uh, my question to uh, Mr. Deshai is uh, demonetization, the concept, was it appropriate and what went wrong, in your opinion? I haven't really um, amassed any black money in my life and probably none of you have either. But just ask yourselves, suppose you had black money, where would you keep it? And the answer is obvious. Almost all of it is kept in real estate. People underprice, undervalue real estate and pay the difference in cash. And that is black money. So let's say 99% of the black money is in real estate. Perhaps 1% was in cash. So the government has solved 1% of the problem in order to inconvenience 99% of the people. This is my view of demonetization. Why did this happen? There also I have a theory. Uh, just look at the economists in this country. Think of good, good economists like 
parts are this one. Um, can you think of anyone who supports BJP? I can't. So when BJP came to power, it had a problem. Every, every government needs economists, and they couldn't think of any Indian economists. So what did they do? They imported Indian economists from outside, like my friend Arvind Subramanian. Arvind Subramaniam, Arvind Panagarya, and so on. And Arvind Panagarya did very good work in the Planning Commission. He even gave a great talk, a one-hour talk, to Prime Minister Modi about how to develop India. For a whole year he waited. He never heard from Modi. So the poor man went back. Arvind Subramaniam, as Chief Economic Advisor, has been producing some of the most interesting, some of the most perceptive economic surveys for the last four years. But look at those economic surveys and look at the budgets. There's absolutely no connection between the two. Either the finance minister didn't understand a word of them or he didn't read them. So, um, Arvind Subramaniam, um, in fact, what happened was that um, after his last survey, I wrote saying that he's the only chief economic advisor who produced better economic surveys than I did. So he sent me a message saying, I am overwhelmed. And for the first time he, since he became CA, I invited him for lunch. We had a very good lunch. And he said, I am leaving. I'm going to Harvard. So that was the end of him. So this government is not only extremely short of economic, circum economic expertise, but it does not realize that it's short of economic e expertise and does not care, which is why it makes the, such enormous mistakes and I'm afraid we may see some bigger mistakes in the next five years. Ask your question. I'm Anirudho Lahiri. Uh, I'm here as a past president of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, I also had the opportunity to work together for a while with Dr. Desai when I was, the, I was with ABP, the Andhra group. Dr. Desai, what is your, um, uh, I don't know if it's the right question to ask at this juncture, but what is your take on the disbanding of the Planning Commission and its so-called replacement by Niti Ayo? Does the same serve the same purpose or is there something missing in the planning process. That is one. And the second one, if there is time, is you know, you talked about India's position in the world economy, global economy, how it ranks in terms of um, its GDP, purchasing, par purchasing parity, par parity terms. Wh where are in this, all these metrics, where is the per capita income? You know, even countries like Vietnam and so on and so forth seem to be far ahead of India in terms of per capita income. So where is the reflection of the economic progress and growth on the per capita income? Thank you. Uh, to answer your second question first, we look at our growth. Um, we don't look at other countries' growth. The fact is other countries are also growing. And on the average, they are growing at roughly the same rate as India, on the average. Which means that India's position in the list of countries under GDP, PPP, does not change much over time. So certainly, I mean, India has been doing very well. 
And we look only at India's figures and we say, ah, oh, great India, we are doing so well. We are doing so well. But the world is doing well. The industrial developed countries grow less fast because they are richer. But otherwise, countries like Vietnam, many of them actually grow faster than we do. And so our performance is not anything extraordinary. Uh, coming to your second question on the Planning Commission. Mm, I agree. Well, I think that the Planning Commission was not a very effective or efficient institution, uh, but it served two purposes. One was that it coordinated <clears throat> the economic policies of the center and the states. And secondly, it looked forward five years. Now, it's not five years is not, there's nothing particular about five years, but every country that wants to develop has to look forward. You can't really just be satisfied with an annual budget. You have to look, let's say, if you're building ports, you have to look 10 years ahead. If you're building airports, you may have to look 15 years ahead, and so on. And so, a government simply has to look forward over a number of years. And the planning, planning commission was one way of doing it. Now, these people uh, abolished the planning commission. On the other hand, they have great ambitions, which have a long-term dimension. For example, they are very keen on developing ports, but they have no machinery to look forward, with the result that you'll see that there has been very little done on development of ports in these last four years. Uh, there has been more on airports because airport development has been going on for quite some time. And the demand for air travel is growing so fast in this country that the government has to invest in airports. So I think the government is missing out on a part of its functions by abolishing the Planning Commission or NITI. I would not recreate it, but I would certainly create a machinery for looking forward a number of years. Even, let's say, the British government, which is hardly a, a socialist government, has, well, looks forward four years to five years. Thank you so much. It's lovely listening to you. Sir, I would, uh, I, I would uh, we, we are actually bang on time. And the, uh, the uh, minister is likely to be here. So if you will permit, I will close this Q&A session. There are, the besides is going to be here, so we, hopefully he will join us this day. In which case, uh, there will be other opportunities to speak with him in the practice. I would like to, on behalf of the chamber and uh, uh, all of you, I would like to uh, uh, sincerely thank Mr. Desai for being with us today, for having given us a, a lot of food for thought. And I think the chamber itself and our, my colleagues who are working in the research branch will have enough opportunity to look at these suggestions to, and to present these to appropriate policy makers, either at the state or in the state government or in Delhi, at, in an appropriate time. So I would like to... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, it was a most absorbing session, and thanks to the fascinating insights and some straight talk by Dr. Desai and the observations of Mr. Sunil Mitra, the chamber is able to set our own perspectives for the plethora of multidimensional activities that uh, we would be engaging with at the center as well as, as at the state level for the coming year. We shall share with you the records of the discussions and the paper on proceedings as soon as we can. In the August presence of our chief guest, Dr. Amit Mitro, 
Honorable Minister in Charge, Finance, Industry, Commerce and Enterprises, and MSME and Textiles, Government of West Bengal, Guests of Honor, His Excellency Adam Burakowski, Ambassador of the Republic of Poland in India, and Mr. Bernard Stein Ruke, Director General, Indo German Chamber of Commerce. May we commence the plenary session of our AGM 2018. We shall commence this session with a short audiovisual presentation on what we did as a Chamber of Commerce as an organization this past year, the year that was. Ami Bangla e Gangai, Ami Bangla e Gangai, Ami Amar Ami Keti Rodin, Ei Bangla e Kuje Pai. Living through the shared modern business and commercial history of the nation and becoming the herald for Shonar Bangla to shores far and near has been the cherished calling of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry a majestic institution of 186 years of heritage, yet sparkling with the vibrancy of youth. The year gone by seamlessly weaves into the year to come. The 100 plus programs, the rich and rewarding overseas connects, the partnerships with the government, the economic research projects, all are to be continued with a plomb as part of one continuous and self-sustaining process. The year commenced exactly 12 months back and we have been truly fortunate to have had the presence of personalities who give shape to modern business, governance and indeed the very fabric of society. In this journey, we have been privileged to have had the guidance, support and participation of the government of West Bengal at every step. The showcasing of the tremendous strides made by Bengal in business through the eyes of the Chambers of Commerce who are the facilitators of business was a most special way to commence our activities. Our partnership with the government of West Bengal in instituting the first ever tech incubation hub with support from Bandhan has been ideated as a dedicated platform for tech startups to express themselves and to catalyze their business models to fruition. The international work of the Chamber is premised on India's strategic and geopolitical realities. The focus of the Chamber stretches from the Indo-Pacific to Western Europe and the United States. In this realm, the Chamber hosted a number of focused meets, interactive sessions, delegations and workshops. Creating business opportunities for our stakeholders is our driving principle. Three business delegations, interactions with senior most overseas diplomats, apart from hosting overseas business delegations, defined our Overseas Connect work. Special workshops and seminars on trade and logistics continued throughout the year. Simultaneously, the newly minted Bengal Chamber Research Cell undertook a wide array of critical projects. We held the first ever summit on millennial learning addressing the key to strategize our approach to holistic education. Our groundbreaking conclave on royal aging and felicitation of senior citizens was our way of saying thank you to those who even in their twilight are ensuring the brightest of days for the generations much after their own. Our annual Sun Feast, Farm Light, Health and Lifestyle Quiz and a host of other programs on health issues, special Doctor's Day events and our very humble efforts on Kerala flood relief were other notable activities. The Chamber's Health Tech Forum with Medica brought together doctors, hospitals, technology companies and overseas business collaborators from Japan, Georgia and Bangladesh. Our annual business IT conclave focused on the very contemporary issues of fintech and blockchain. In fact, our various initiatives in IT were spread over Kolkata and Mumbai. Energy and environment advocacy is close to our heart. Our engagement is truly at multifarious levels. 
The 11th edition of our flagship Environment and Energy Conclave on Disruptive Innovations in Energy Transitions. Several other programs on ecology in Durgapur. Launching the first ever Chamber Academia collaboration in publishing the international edited compilation on sustainable energy technologies. Partnering the World Sustainability Development Summit in New Delhi and so much more. Providing a meaningful forum for entrepreneurs and startups is a continuous activity with the objective of creating the right ecosystem for a self-generating employment model. The Bengal Chamber is stepping up on its skills sector activities by creating the forum for skills training providers and corporate recruiters to meet under the aegis of the state government. On another note, the pioneering financial conclave in Mumbai was a showstopper. Addressed by CXOs from the banking and insurance sectors, capital markets, new age payment banks and small finance banks, it was the first ever chamber mega activity in the nation's financial capital. Interactive sessions on corporate governance and risk, sessions on budget analysis at the state and central levels, regular monthly workshops on various aspects of and updates on GST, certificate courses on international business, and Workshops, including those on direct taxation, were part of most essential and heavily subscribed chamber services to its membership. Competence building, value enhancement through value engineering, growing one's business, IPRs, and injecting competitiveness were the driving forces behind our MSME and manufacturing programs, as was the focus on the growth in the steel sector which was, in fact, the cornerstone of our annual Metals Conclave this year. The Chamber was also proud to be associated with and assist the MSME and Textiles Department of the Government of West Bengal in the State MSME Conclave. Our eclectic bouquet of activities continued with our annual marketing conclave, the buzzword being Influencer Marketing, and of course, our very own Think Sessions, having iconic speakers with topics ranging from strategic and defense to climate change and leadership. The session with the inimitable Dr. Shashi Tharoor speaking on New India deserves special mention. With logistics being a prime mover of the state's economy, the Chamber's shipping focus stayed with developments and changing scenario in Indian ports and the challenges in maritime logistics. Cooperative federalism and infrastructure development was the focus for our annual infrastructure summit. Employability, meaningful industry academy interface and strategic dialogue, people management and HR management in a disruptive era, corporate chess meets, corporate golfing meet in the Northeast, the annual Bengal Chamber Golf Trophy in Kolkata, walkathons and felicitations of iconic sportspersons were all part of our initiatives to bring people together. Adding a splash of vibrant colors to the Chamber's calendar of activities were our social and cultural offerings, which included our very own tribute to mothers from their children who are renowned names in their chosen walks of life. Ratnagarbha is a movement that we hold close to our heart. Music from legends and contemporary trendsetters and from Opar Bangla. Felicitation of Miss World winners, hosting New Age Theatre and addressing healthy living were all part of the chamber happenings. The programs of Myriad Hughes included a most diverse assortment of topics ranging from gender parity with McKenzie to our specially minted Calcutta Talks celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Howrah Bridge and also Calcutta's spectacular rise as a global city. A grand initiative which highlighted the mammoth consumer market that Kolkata is so well known for was the bringing together of almost 21 Indian states and 17 countries participating in the annual India International Mega Trade Fair. The city's prominence as a preferred destination for exhibitors from across the world was highlighted through this fair. The Chamber lives through its activities, breathes through its multifarious programs and moves forward 
through its continued pursuit towards excellence in hitherto unexplored realms. The story continues. Thank you. May I now request Mr. Chandra Shekhar Ghosh, President of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, to please deliver his President's address. Sir. Respected Dr. Ramit Mitra, Honorable Minister in Charge, Finance, Commerce and Enterprises, MSME and Textiles. Dr. Ashok Deshai, who is a very renowned economist in our country. Uh, His Excellency uh, Adam Burakowski, who is the Ambassador Embassy of the Republic of Poland. Mr. Sunil Mitro, and uh, Chairperson Sunil Mitro is the Chairperson of the Economic Affairs Committee of Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Mr. Indrajit Shain, who is the President-designate of the Chamber, all the members in this room, the, our Chamber colleagues, my friends from media, ladies and gentlemen. In September 2017, exactly a one year ago, when I look over the President of Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry, I had said that the theme and focus for the year 2017-18 would be the year of going beyond the Bengal. Even though this is the oldest chamber of commerce and industry, almost all its program had been held in Kolkata. Therefore, we decided the chamber must be go beyond the East and hold seminars and round table discussions on critical and contemporary issues in Mumbai and Delhi. One of the main focus areas of the chamber in the year was to address through its various forum the critical issues that India's financial sector has been facing. The burning issues are the bloating bad loans in the banking industry, use of technology in banking and finance, and financial inclusion. Only a strong, inclusive banking sector can support the growth story of Asia's third largest economy. During the past one year, the Bengal Chamber's constant efforts were to bring the stakeholders together, create relevant forums for the members and industries at large to discuss and dissect the issue of the concern. This has led to holding more than 100 events of national and international and of critical relevance. This a part the chamber has held regular meeting and interaction with foreign diplomats, captain of the industry, bureaucrats, academician, ministers, and internationally renowned through leaders. It gives me immense satisfaction to say that indeed we stepped out of West Bengal and hand our first ever financial conclave in Mumbai in the two weeks before. This was graced by a deputy governor of Reserve Bank of India, two managing directors of biggest lenders in our country, the State Bank of India, and the other senior bankers, uh, uh, that is we call the small finance bank, their MD and CEO, payment banks, their MD and CEOs, and different insurance professionals have been given their thoughts about the country and about the eastern region in, in that conference. We have sent trade delegates to various countries during the year. 
ranging from the neighboring Bangladesh to Russia and Australia. And each of these delegates has been extremely successful. Further, the chamber has hosted delegates and dignitaries from the US, Australia, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, Indonesia, Ghana, and a few other countries. I am happy to say that the chamber's overseas relationship have strengthened by leaps and bounds during the year. I am also extremely delighted to inform you that the chamber signed a memorandum of understanding with the West Bengal Electronics Industry Development Corporation Limited to set up a tech incubation center at Webel Bhavan. Government has provided the premises as a free and some other services. And Bengal Chamber of Commerce will provide this, uh, the facilities to the uh, startup uh, uh, IT. It was done during the inauguration of Bengal Silicon Valley Hub on 13th August 2018 in the gracious presence of our Srimati Mamata Banerjee, Honorable Chief Ministers of West Bengal. Dr. Amit Mitro, Honorable Minister in Charge, Department of Finance, Industry, Commerce and Enterprises, MSME and Textiles, and other dignitaries. I aspire to take this initiative forwards to encourage entrepreneurship and provide deserving potential entrepreneurs with a platform to translate their concept and ideas into business model. The initiatives would continue in the years to come. We, myself, active support and participate in this program. Further, I would also like to involve in this socially engaging package project known as the Digital Village Program. That is also government of the West Bengal have been helping us and joined together in Bandhan Bank and BCCI to provide a platform for ensuring financial inclusion through the digital and cashless road at the rural level. Similarly, our initiative in agri-sector development and catalyzing concept like agri-business school would be set up in Bengal. And this is our priority on that. As my tenure comes to a close, it gives me immense pleasure to share with you that your chamber has left a footprint in many new issues, new many areas. We will continue to strive to improve our services for the members the industry at large, and the government, and the civil society. I have been extremely fortunate to have the unstained support of my fellow office bearers, my colleagues in the management committee, and the chamber's most committed secretariat. It has been a great teamwork all through. The wise counsel of the former presidents of the chamber, the kind advice and guidance of the honorable ministers and bureaucrats of the state government, and support from the media have made this year special and unforgettable. It has been a rare honor and privilege to serve this historic institution as its president. I take this opportunity to thank the Bengal Chamber's family for some wonderful memories. Before I close, I share the new one thought, which will be like to continue in the, the future. We are organizing the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Bandhan Bank, along with the two Bengal, the three days, the Bengali Magic Program, and it will be held in January. Date will be uh, like to inform in the later. And it will be yearly program continue by Bengal Chamber of Commerce to awarded of the P 
people, those are uh, every time are encouraging us and given some entertainment to us. The legacy of the 186 years old chamber will get stronger with the passage of time. I wish Mr. Indronil Shane, President designate of the chamber and eventful and exciting years ahead. Thank you to all of you. Namaskar. Thank you, sir. May I now request Mr. Indrajit Sen, President designate the Bengal Chamber, to please briefly present a most important agenda for the Chamber in the coming year so that we have the privilege of making our Chief Guest, Honorable Dr. Amit Mitra, aware of such an ambitious initiative, sir. Honorable Dr. Amit Mitra, His Excellency Adam Burakowski, Ambassador of Poland, Dr. Ashok Desai, Mr. Bernard Sandruke, Director General of Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, members of the Diplomatic Corps, former presidents of the Bengal Chamber, distinguished guests, friends from the media, ladies and gentlemen. Today, we come to a close of a highly successful year of the Chamber under the leadership of Sri Chandrasekhar Ghosh and start the journey for another year. This is not a new journey, but passing of the baton of the same journey which started 186 years back. <coughs> the journey of the chamber has always been to nurture the interest of the industry and to align the same with the visions of the government and the state of uh, government of the state and that of the nation. While it is true that there are some specific sectors which requires in high investments. The true backbone of economy is the small and medium sector who are the major contributors to country's GDP and export and also provides over 70% of the industrial employment. This is not unique to India and similar pattern also exists in highly industrialized countries such as Germany. In a recent conference, both Honorable Chief Minister of West Bengal, Srimati Mamata Banerjee, and the Honorable Finance Minister, Sri Dr. Amit Mitra, emphasized on the importance of MSME sector for the West Bengal's economy. The Honorable Chief Minister also conveyed her vision that the MSMEs of West Bengal should be comparable with the best in the world. To achieve this goal, the MSME sector in West Bengal will need access to cutting edge technology and continually upgrade the skill to the compatible level. I'm happy to inform you that as a journey, as a journey towards this end, the Bengal Chamber is starting the center of excellence for MSME sector in West Bengal. And this, to this is being done in partnership with Indo-German Chamber of Commerce, and this will help the MSME in West Bengal to identify suitable technology partners from Germany and also facilitate skill development program with the help of senior expert service. This program, which is a program which is run by German Association of Chambers of Industry and Commerce, DIHK. Ladies and gentlemen, we are delighted to exchange the MOU of, with IGCC today in the presence of the Honorable Finance Minister. And I end by saying that we do believe and look forward to many years of industrial prosperity of West Bengal. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep you updated on this very important initiative, uh, co-branded project as we progress through the year. May I now request Dr. Amit Mitro, Honorable Minister in Charge, Finance, Industry, Commerce and Enterprises and MSME and Textiles, Government of West Bengal, to please deliver the Bengal Chamber AGM commemorative address, sir. 
Namaskar. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, what a pleasure to be here and uh, be part of this uh, galaxy of industrialists uh, and those entrepreneurs of Bengal. Uh, I must first say that you've already had a fantastic session as a starter or warmer where my very good friend, Dr. Ashok Desai, uh, and made a presentation. And there can't be any Ashok Desai or Amit Mitra without controversy. <laughs> because we both thrive as economists, we are supposed to say contrarian things. But when I put on the ministerial hat, I have to speak in a different uh, perspective in terms of construction and the future. I miss, missed what Dr. Deshai may have said, but I believe he said something quite challenging. Uh, and uh, also, I'm very happy that Mr. Sunil, Sunil Mitra was here. He is a very important person, former revenue uh, and finance secretary of government of India. Of course, the, uh, I'm delighted that you have with you the Honorable uh, His Excellency Mr. Bur uh, Burkowski, Burakowski, I hope that pronunciation is right, Honorable, uh, Honorable uh, Ambassador of Poland. We had a very good meeting yesterday, and we discussed a lot of engagements with Poland, which is already on way. In fact, uh, it was very nice that we had the Deputy Foreign Minister of Poland joining us at the Bengal Global Business Summit this year, and we've signed an MOU with uh, already with uh, a major state in Poland uh, and uh, state to state and uh, we will take that effort forward. I'm sure uh, I, since I have to today we have our cabinet meeting so I will have to leave after I speak most apologetically so I will not be able to hear Ambassador and of course my friend uh, Mr. Steinbrucke uh, who I've known for many years he's been extremely helpful I'm delighted that you are here too. And uh, the president, of course, is the one who uh, pushed me to come today despite the uh, very pressures. Uh, in fact, I was in my office since the morning and came from Navanno Strait, uh, Mr. Chandrasekhar Ghosh, iconic entrepreneur of India. Started from a, started from a sweet meat shop, Mishtit Dokan. And today he is the chairman of a bank recognized by the Reserve Bank of India. What a journey. And I think some things on entrepreneurship when they are written, uh, your entrepreneurship from right from the bottom of the pyramid up will be lit written in golden letters. Uh, I'm also very happy that Mr. Indrajit Chen is taking over as the president designate uh, with a lot of German connections for, uh, in manufacturing. Uh, it's, it was an honor for me that in my presence you exchanged uh, this very important engagement with Indo-German Chamber and uh, Bengal, Global, uh, Global, uh, Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And as you know, in Germany they call them Mittelstand. And what proportion of your GDP is produced by them, Mr. Scheinbrook? Maybe something like 80, 90 percent is produced by the Mittelstand. So uh, you, I'm very happy that you've signed on this, and I'll say a few words on that later. And of course, I'm very happy that our additional Chief Secretary, MSME, and T, is present here, Mr. Alapan Bandobadhyay. So this signing is very significant for you, Mr. Bandobadhyay. We need to work with Bengal Chamber and the German Chamber to take this forward in your space as additional Chief Secretary of the Department of MSME and textiles. Very happy that Mr. Ghosh, Director General, is piloting this process. And of course, all the friends and guests here, many of whom I know for many, many years indeed. Uh, let, me, um, let me start by saying that uh, we stand, at a, in a way, at a very difficult time. I'm sure which Dr. Desai may have spoken about. Uh, if you look at the indicators, the, you know, part of it is also tect tect uh, tectonics, perceptions. I think with the rupee uh, plummeting, 
uh, current account deficit uh, hitting uh, very dangerous positions. Uh, as you know, 2.5% of GDP is at best the kind of benchmark. We are close to it. And the future prediction is that we will go perhaps to 2.8% of GDP, which is very, very dangerous indeed. Uh, you can look at other indicators as well. They, of course, the oil price, uh, which uh, seems to be climbing and climbing. With all this put together, on one hand, there is a deep concern of what the Indian economy is doing uh, at certain dangerous levels. On the other, when we look at West Bengal, uh, in this environment. We are delighted and very happy that at least West Bengal is moving forward, for which I'll give you some statistic which you will certainly enjoy. Difficult times, but that's the time when the tough gets get working, when the tough moves forward towards achieving new frontiers. So under Mamata Banerjee's leadership, I'm part of her cabinet, we feel that this is the time for the tough guys to be there and work our way through in Bengal and make a specific example in India of what is possible despite these macroeconomic indicators that we talked about. I was very concerned and yesterday Honorable Chief Minister has issued a small press note to the media on this subject. Uh, it is interesting that, uh, let me give a thought, uh, thought that is uh, not normally spoken of, when uh, in July 2014, uh, the, uh, the excise duty, the, sorry, the, the uh, crude oil price was $104 a barrel. Now that fell by February 2016 to $33.01 a barrel. That's a huge fall. Now how did we take advantage of that fall? Uh, perhaps all of you know, at least those of you who don't would be inform well informed, that United States has a strategic petroleum reserves structure. I don't know how many of you know that. And in that strategic petroleum reserve structure, uh, in Texas and Louisiana, deep under the ground, uh, they have reserves of about 727 million barrels. Uh, and this was started after the oil crunch in the 1970s. And they have built that up, 1974 to be precise, when the oil embargo happened. Now, India too, believe it or not, has a strategic petroleum reserve. It's called Strategic Petroleum Reserve Limited. And it has in some places about 5.33 million metric tons. Uh, in, in reserve, but you know that for the United States, they have a minimum reserve of such a vast economy of 18 or 20 trillion US dollars, they still have a reserve for 60 days. Per perhaps they say 60 days, my suspicion is it's maybe 80 or 100 days. For strategic reasons, they may not be giving us the exact number. Unfortunately, India's reserves that we have could be between 5 to 10 days. 10 days they say, but my suspicion is it's more like five days, which is we are on a dangerous point. Now, question is, why didn't the government of India further strengthened during the time when uh, crude oil prices fell to $33 uh, dollars a barrel, would they not have developed this further? Chances are they didn't. And I think that's a very... Uh, interesting uh, issue of a government that works, a government that governs, the government that thinks ahead. So when oil prices are high, you could use the reserves for certain purpose. You could also have, if possible, a fuel price st stabilization fund, which I don't think many people have. But again, I throw an idea at you. Why didn't, when the prices were but oil prices were low, that was the time to create a fuel price stabilization fund, which can then be used like a buffer stock fund. When things go up, something you can flow in. It's a Keynesian intervention of a minor nature, which can be very significant to the economy. So my submission to you is, it's a, it's a very, very 
difficult situation when the central government increased the uh, the uh, their own uh, excise duty from 9 rupees 48 paise uh, to 19 rupees 48 paise for petrol that's a 10 rupee increase again on diesels we find the price when they came to office this government was 3 rupees 56 paise per liter raised to 15 rupees 33 per liter that's an increase of 11 rupees 77 paise per liter as a contrast the state we could have increased our sales tax uh, we could have increased our cess we did not and yesterday as a gesture of being with the people the chief minister announced a 1 rupee reduction which has gone into effect i believe today it is only a gesture to say we did not increase but at least symbolically we are there with you the common people now central government's price increases phenomenal uh, from uh, approximately uh, 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 rupees uh, petrol uh, again price increase petrol from 65 rupees 12 paise to 81 rupees 60 paise last reading september 2018 hefty increase hefty increase by rupees 24.46 per liter of diesel all of this what does it all mean to bengal chamber of commerce and industry and the economy of india and economy of bengal i think what it means what worries me is that once this happens and rupee uh, really sinks the questions come up on inflationary pressures I believe IMF is saying that our CPI, consumer price index, may go up to 5.2% this year. I'm not sure Dr. Desai does much more research than I do. Uh, we may be able to say that inflationary expectations, economists talk about expectations, not just inflation. When inflationary expectations set in, then what happens? Then, of course, the Reserve Bank of India comes in. Uh, and raises interest rates. Whatever the reason, however I agree or disagree is a different matter. Usually that happens. Which means that if interest rate goes up, automatically it has many reverberations. Your EMI for housing, scooters, cars, all this becomes higher on one side. On the other side, you as investors may have had a project and the project will have a, a present value for future returns discounted by the interest rate. You will find that the same project was viable yesterday is not viable today. So you may, at least some of you may cancel your projects based on the viability issue once the Reserve Bank hardens the interest rate or moves up. So I'm deeply concerned that this kind of a drop in the rupee, the petrol price, the diesel price, the ecosystem of feelings and expectations of inflationary pressure could lead to this process. And what that means is that the GDP growth rate will be negatively hit. This is my deep concern that I share with you. And you must tighten your belts as entrepreneurs to be ready to face this if it were to happen, which I wish it won't happen, but it can happen. Are you ready for this? What can the chamber do for you in this environment so that you can fight through this in Bengal? Friends, I would like to give you some data on Bengal, which you may have heard before. The uh, latest data, this is 2011-12 base. We have been debating with the center on what is our GDP, what is our GDP growth for almost one year. You'll be happy to know we have six trained econometricians uh, who are working on this. And uh, we have been arguing with the center. Uh, we still continue the argument. 
What, is, why, what was our basis of arguing that our GDP is, in fact, we think it is 11 and a half lakh crores? What is the basis? The basis was that uh, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs was suddenly switched to uh, on the industrial front, and they do surveys, and those surveys are not aggregated by states. And we do not know the nature of that survey, the stratification of the data. So we argue on very technical grounds with the central government. And we've been doing that for the last one year, saying that give us the disaggregated data. But they can't give us the disaggregated data, which doesn't exist. Anyhow, finally, the central government has agreed at least to step one, which is West Bengal has passed the 10 lakh crore GDP mark accepted by Central Statistical Organization, 10.20. We still feel it is a little above 11 lakh crores, and that discussion and debate on econometrics will continue. What happened to industrial growth? India grew in 2000, uh, this is with the official statistic of CSO. India grew by 5.54%, 1718. According to CSO's admitted quantum now, India, uh, West Bengal grew by 16.29%. That you may not have known. And it's not my data. Services, India grew by 7.92%. West Bengal grew by 9.27%. If you take a look at the GSDP, India grew by... I, first data I gave you was an industry. 5.54 industrial growth. Bengal, 6.29%. Go back to GDP, 6.70 India, 9.15 West Bengal, according admitted by the Central Statistical Organization. If you take GVA, gross value added, India grew by 6.50, West Bengal grew by 9.59%. 9.59%. Now you may say, why don't you double check this with index of industrial production? IIP. It's a good check to look at what happened to IIP at the same time. Well, interestingly, uh, India, uh, IIP for India grew by 4.4%, West Bengal grew by 8.9%. So that kind of checks out what you are seeing on the aggregate industry figure. Let me turn for a moment to a deep issue, and I'm very glad that you signed this agreement, because this will be part of that, current account deficit. Uh, highest in four years, current account deficit. That brings you to MSME. Why? Because MSME are the most dynamic exporters of our state. I'd like to also submit, which the additional chief secretary would find useful. We set a target with the banking system in West Bengal, which is called state, uh, uh, the SLBC, State Level Banking Committee. We set a target of 38,000 crores of lending by banks in 1718. You'll be happy to know that the final data came in from the banks. They have lent 44,000 crores, exceeding the target by 6,000 crores. As soon as that happened in that meeting, I immediately upped the target. That's the way all of you work. When somebody achieves a target, you push that person to up the target. The target is now 50,000 crores of lending this year, 2018-19. And the initial first quarter data shows that again, perhaps we will perform, our state's bank lending will perform equally well as last time. I can't predict right now because the year is not looking in the macro sense so good. But this is the highest lending in India in terms of MSME. When we came to office, there were uh, 45, uh, 47 clusters. Now we have 445. Because that's where the, that's where the jobs are. In one place, in uh, Bantala, we have 1,20,000 people working. I don't know if anybody from Bantala, investors here? The leather guys? It's a leather cluster, you are. What is the number you have there, sir? Working employees? You have 1,200 people. 
four and a half billion, four and a half million wallets. Here you are, a living example of what I'm saying. Somebody who's sitting here, who has those numbers and total of one lakh twenty thousand. I thought it was one lakh. I was corrected last time. It was one lakh twenty thousand people working in Mantala. And I gave you the example where the Kanpur guys wanted to move out of UP, uh, at least expand into West Bengal for obvious reasons. You know what is going on in UP. And they were to invest 1,000 crores and I asked them how many jobs. They said 6,000 jobs. 1,000 crore investment, 6,000 jobs. That's what MSME is about. That's what Mittelstand is about in Germany. So uh, what is very exciting for me is that the employer, employing entity in the country, you put up a cement plant. Some of you sitting here may have a cement plant. Uh, we have got five additional investments into West Bengal for cement plants, 700 crores investment. How many jobs? Maybe 250, maybe 300, maybe if you take indirect employment, all that, 500. But look, 1,000 crore investment in leather produces 6,000 crore job. So what is your investment, sir, in Mantala, approximately? And you employ 1,200 people. You have a living, living example right here. So what we are saying is I'm so excited that Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry has signed this with the Germans. They are the masters at this. And we hope to see that that is where, at the end of the day, as Dr. Desai will tell you, James Buchanan got the Nobel Prize for saying what? that politicians maximize votes, just as you maximize profit and share value. One very important component of vote maximization and democracy is job creation. That's how you get, of course, infrastructure. So my submission is that this moves me to exports. You'll be happy to know that our exports in 2016-17 was 8.23 billion US dollars. 17, 18, in one year's time, it went up to 9.15 billion US dollars. That's an 11.17% growth. 11, more than 11% growth in one year. So I have given a target that by 2021, we have to double this export. It is possible. If you, sitting here, entrepreneurs, get together and say, say that we'll make it happen. For that, what have we done, government? New export policy. It's a new export policy. New SLBC subcommittee, state level banking committee, did not have an export subcommittee. I've got it formed. And they, are, they have already had their first meeting. So that lending constraint is eased for you to export. But my tragedy? As far as GST is concerned, what you're not getting, I know, you won't say this probably in public because of the environment in the country, probably you're not, what you're not getting is refund. Is that correct? Am I correct? Which earlier you didn't have to pay, you'd fill a form and that's it and you didn't have to pay any tax. Now you have to pay tax in advance and you have to seek refund. And Dr. Desai, you and I know what happens when you have to seek refund from the government. You're not getting it. And MSME is in serious problem. That's why I'm not saying this. You're saying. For this reason. Why? Why you're in problem? GSTR1 form. You can fill and upload. No problem. GSTR form, form 2 was to self-populate in terms of the purchasers. There is no GSTR 2. Hasn't happened. So what did, we, what did the GST council chaired by the union finance minister said? Let's quickly do some makeshift. You see, this government unfortunately often does these makeshift with monetize, demonetization or launching of GST in advance. And what's the makeshift? GSTR form 3B. Now it's a one-page form, very good, but no invoices. Result is, those who want to do some hanky-panky, they are putting in lots of input tax credit material. And my concern is that you have now black money, hawala, 
racketeering because you have don't have to upload in invoices. Then I read in the papers that they are going to introduce now GSTR 2A. As a member of the GST Council and chairman of the Empart Committee, I have never heard of that. Some official says that they are going to introduce. Complete mess. And who is hurt by this? The small and medium enterprises. They are the ones who are, and therefore I am so glad you formed this group in, uh, in the Bengal Chamber. Because we have to, and by the way, any problems you have, we have opened up centers, we are holding camps to help you. How to handle this premature launching in a bravado from the Parliament Central Hall, uh, a tryst with destiny, launching of the GST. I had said very strongly, publicly, please do trials. Please do what everybody else in the world does. Please do pilot project and see how it is working. No, it has to be launched now. And it hurts me and pains me that it is the small and medium enterprises, which is the base of your chamber, is the one that is hurting the most as a result of this. Let me back off for a second. Capital expenditure of the government, very, very important. All of you know that seven and a half times increase in capital expenditure in last six years. Therefore, some people say, I don't know what my friend Dr. Desai will say, Kolkata looks good. You go to the countryside, then you will really know. 14,000 kilometers of uh, in, uh, village roads, over 12,000, now perhaps 14,000 kilometers of highways, schools, colleges, all this is capital expenditure. Seven times we have increased. Plan expenditure, three and a half times. Of course, GDP I have already indicated to you, crossed the benchmark of 10 lakh crores, according to central government. We think it's more like 11, 11 and a half. Let me uh, conclude by one very important element in our overall strategy, which I would like the chamber to be part of. A recent study shows that 54% of jobs are old jobs. That means jobs which are the type of job is something that is already there. We want more of it, 54%. 34% are earlier jobs restructured. That means some more human capital, some marginal changes. 34% are older jobs which have been restructured. Only 9%, according to this study, are new jobs. So when we talk of artificial intelligence, I heard that when I was sitting there. When we talk about artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, big data, for which we have a park, which uh, I think uh, you, when you were president, sir, you uh, took that park from Bengal uh, on behalf of your chamber. And uh, I think what is interesting is that what we were trying to do there, we are trying to do artificial intelligence, big data, but we couldn't find an anchor investor at that time. But I'm warning you that we have to walk on two feet. One big foot is the traditional jobs, restructured traditional jobs. And a small foot, evolving still, is all this talk about artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. Even then, let me tell you, that at the opening of the uh, Bengal, the, uh, the Silicon Valley hub of Bengal, Mamata Banerjee inaugurated it. At that time, 100 acres of land. Demand is excessive now. Now, what is interesting there is TCS, which is employing 40,000 now, and the new campus, they will go to 58,000 IT professionals in Kolkata, bigger than Bengaluru said that day in the meeting, indicated that they'd be interested in more. Cognizant, which is employing 18,000 people right now, have taken already a piece of land where they employ 15,000 more. And now they're going to employ, if they take a piece in the uh, Silicon Valley hub, they'll employ more. People don't know this. I, I'm sure Dr. Desai doesn't know that TCS will have a bigger, already is on the verge of having a bigger campus than Bangalore. 
probably our publicity work, we don't do enough, but we do the work. Now, what is interesting to me is that on one hand, you have the Silicon Valley hub. Genpact came and said, we want to do something. Infosys, in fact, gave a beautiful design done by Hafiz's contractor of the building they are going to build. And therefore, one by one, they came and spoke. And they were very excited and deeply committed to move forward. That's one foot, that one foot on which we will walk. But parallelly, we'll have the big foot on which we'll walk, which is the MSME, which is leather, which is gems and jewelry, which is food processing. Here's a food processing expert with us. And 40% of our fruits and vegetables, we are largest producer of vegetables, second largest producer of food, fruits around that time, that length. 40% spoilage, all of us know. Where is the food processing investment? By the small and medium enterprises. You'll be interested to know, I took a meeting with the Howda uh, clusters. This is before Alapan Babu had joined. There were 60 units, leaders of those were there. You know what they make? They make strings for Indian musical instruments. Now, I push them saying, why not for violin and cello and double bass? Because your market will just... 60 units. So if, when I looked at them and I said, I can't believe this. Shuttlecock, badminton. Many units. And what is interesting is they've already acquired international brands as their outsourced entity. Large number of units. Aside, of course, from textile. We now have 21 items on which we have GI, geographical indication in West Bengal. 21. All MSME. Of course, some of them are three are mangoes. Three of them are saris, which have GI. Not easy to get. So what I'm suggesting today is, in a meeting like this, focus on exports. And I've given you a target. We have to double exports. We have to be at least... 15 billion US dollars in the next two to three years. You give us the strategy, and government will work for it to do this. Focus on MSME, other sectors, where we need scaling up. Do you know in that meeting, there was a gentleman who made make something very beautiful handicraft with coconut shell. You know, an international buyer walked up to him and did what? ordered 10,000 pieces. Probably the guy makes 500 pieces. Now, challenges of scaling up. Can your chamber help us to scale up? Can your chamber help us to do supply chain? How will that guy supply 10,000 pieces? We have to help him. By we, I mean chambers of commerce. Have to organize his supply chain. Now, you know uh, Bisho Bangla store. Dr. Desai, I'd request you to visit the store in uh, airport when you come in and leave. Muslin had died in Bengal, resuscitated. Six months ago, 500 weavers. Now we probably have about 5,000 weavers. Now we pro probably have about 10,000 weavers. Muslin redone. But we have to scale up. Who will do it? Chambers will do it with the help of the government. We'll provide you the infrastructure, the support, the policy structure. You'll have to do it. So my submission today is, aggregate data is looking very good for Bengal. I've given that to you. But at the grassroots level, we'll have to walk on, walk on two feet. Big foot is where your chamber lies, which is fundamental production. I told you 54% jobs are going to be those which are already there. 34% jobs, you have to restructure. And 9% jobs is the other foot of AI and cloud technology and uh, big data. We'll work on it. But let's remember, your chamber's fundamental core competency must be with the 91% jobs. And the remaining 9% jobs, of course, you can work on. And for this, your uh, agreement today with the Germans. They're the best in the world in Mittelstand, 
80 to 90 percent GDP, very high tech, very small, very nimble on their feet. That's the big advantage of small and medium enterprises. Nimble on their feet, quick adjustment to market forces. Big guys can't adjust. So I would conclude by saying, it's a great honor for me to be here with you today. I've taken more time than perhaps you allocated to me. But I thought I'll share with you, not just as an economist, a person, of student of economics, but what I see every day in government. And let me tell you, Mamata Banerjee is absolutely committed she supported GST in principle in 2009. Why? When in a discussion, she gathered that it is the small and medium enterprises which face 20 different taxes. It is small and medium which will benefit the most. And I'm so unhappy today that despite her huge support, it is a small and medium enterprises that is not being able to cope with the GST. And I'm a member of the GST Council, one. Someone said, why don't you, uh, central government, uh, petroleum minister said, states should lower their petroleum tax. Hello, two-thirds of the finance ministers of your GST council, bring it into GST, he said. Two-thirds of the GST council members are BJP states. So is it double speak? Central government minister says, bring it into GST. But the state ministers sitting with me in the GST council don't utter a word. In fact, they said, no, no. So my point is very simple. Despite all these problems, divisive atmosphere in, this, in the country, all that we know, I take great hope, 125th anniversary of Vivekananda's famous lecture in Chicago. World Congress of Religions. Did you know that he failed the first time? They did not give him an entry pass. He took a train and he was going to go away to New York. In the train he met a woman, an elderly woman, who within few hours realized he's a brilliant guy. She connected him to the professor of religious studies in Harvard. He went there, two hours conversation, at the end of which the professor in, at Harvard was absolutely stunned. He sent a cable to the World Congress of Religions, saying, this guy must be given space to speak. Look at him as an entrepreneur. No money. Living in the cold in Chicago in a box. That's entrepreneurship. That's the challenge. The strength of his mind. Even when he goes up to speak, he doesn't have a prepared speech. And he starts by saying, sisters and brothers of America, 1893, sisters and brothers of America, what vision. So I close by saying, Mamata Banerjee was to go to Chicago to speak. Unfortunately, her trip, the Ramakrishna Mission, as you saw in today's papers, was somewhat weighed upon to cancel that lecture. I end by saying, let's take a leaf. 125 years ago, Vivekananda's absolutely stunning, inspiring, spiritual, analytical, but entrepreneurial sense of that great speech, where his guru, Ramakrishna, said, Joto Mot, Toto Pot, the number of ideas to God. And he said, somebody climbs by the ladder, somebody climbs by the rope, somebody discovers some other, that means different religions. But yatomat, tatopat. That's the spirit of Bengal. My father was condemned to death, as many of you know, during INA. In jail, what is the song he sang? He used to sing, Kaji Najrul Islam. Of course, Rabindranath Tagore, he was a specialist in, that was his special. But the songs came from Kaji Nadir Islam's fantastic, spirited songs. So when we speak of poets in Bengal, Kobi, Kobi Guru and Kaji Nadir Islam. That's our, and many of you know, which Dr. Desai may not know, Kaji Nadir Islam. Best, some of his best songs were Ma Kali. 
and he was a practicing Muslim. That is Bengal. India must be taught this Bengal. That that's our spirit. So I close, friends, paying my homage and my pranam to Swami Vivekananda, my mother's guru when I was eight, nine years old. He was the direct disciple of Avedananda. He gave me a picture and said, Eta tomat table rak. Keep it on your table. You know whose picture it was? I said, Eta K. I don't know. Pagli tagli para. Tomar borda. K borda. Swami Vivekananda. I close with my homage to him. No, no, but. Thank you, sir. It was so inspirational. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll just take a couple of minutes of the Honorable Minister's time to complete a very special task ahead of us. The Bengal Heritage uh, is an endeavor by the chamber to collate and publish all the speeches by eminent speakers who delivered their lectures in the Calcutta Talk series. There are three authors to this special publication. Sri Alapan Bandopadhyay, IS, Additional Chief Secretary, Department of MSME and Textiles, Government of West Bengal, is one of the lead authors. May I request Sri Bandopadhyay to please grace the dais. We also have two other authors, Mr. Monish Chakraborty, well-known conservation architect, and Sri Amitabh Ghoshal, renowned civil engineering consultant. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Ghoshal is here. The chamber decided that, you know, it, we, we are sitting on a lot of heritage and it's our duty to bring that heritage to you all and hence this publication. This is in commemoration of our Calcutta gallery right outside this hall and we call this the Bengal heritage. Uh, Sri Bantupadha has taken lead in helping us edit it and also sort of, you know, take us through the intricacies of each and every article that, that is part of this. Uh, Shri Bhantapathe, would you just like to, you know, say a few words? I think, uh, Shri Bhantapathe, I'm sure, would you like to say a word? I think we thank the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industries for taking the trouble to go into the built artisanal, mercantile and industrial heritage of the city and the state. They connect the industrial pursuits with our heritage passions, and that's a great endeavor. Mr. Amboris Dashgupta, past president, the Director General Shubhodip, his able colleague Shomamitra Mukherjee and others have really taken great pains to bring out this very well-documented anthology. We also thank the speakers and the scholars who had taken the trouble to speak and then write out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I request Mr. Chandrasekhar Ghosh, President, to please present Dr. Amit Mitra with a token of our deep appreciation for being with us this morning. The Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of the Republic of Poland to India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Afghanistan. In the context of the great work that uh, Poland has taken forward with the, with the state of West Bengal, we thought that it will be a very opportune time for us to have His Excellency with us this morning and take us through what he plans, not only as far as his country is concerned with India, but also with respect to the state government. There are a lot of developments in energy. There are a lot of developments in related areas. Over to you, sir, His Excellency. Namaskar. 
Unfortunately, I uh, have a very short time uh, because I have to leave for the plane. But uh, thank you very much for coming here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amit Mitro, uh, our uh, very good uh, friend. We met many times. And uh, thank you, the BCCI, for organizing this. And uh, uh, congratulations uh, for Mr. Ghosh for having uh, being the president of the BCCI. And congratulations for Mr. Sen for taking over. We just uh, met with Mr. Sen like two weeks ago in, in Delhi. So I'll be very short because, as I said, uh, Poland uh, was a partner country for Bengal Summit uh, for uh, a few consecutive years, and uh, we plan to be the, uh, also the partner country in the next year edition. And we uh, are very close to cooperating with uh, West Bengal, on, especially on uh, coal um, business. And uh, I hope that uh, we'll be coming uh, with something uh, um, big uh, very soon. So uh, here is my um, presentation. Uh, this is Poland, population uh, 38.5 million. Uh, one of the most vibrant markets of Europe and uh, one of the uh, most important countries of the uh, European Union. Uh, here, uh, uh, this is Polish economy in numbers. Uh, this picture is from Warsaw, the capital of, of, uh, of Poland. GDP growth rate for last year was uh, 4.2, one of the biggest in the European Union. This is the seventh largest economy of the European Union. Uh, 150 uh, Indian companies operating in Poland. And uh, I would like to ask you to make it for, from this 150, like uh, 1,500. Um, and uh, 14 uh, special economic zones and GDP per capita is uh, uh, 30 kilo US day. <coughs> Here uh, you may see our, some of our improvements. Uh, the doing business rank is, uh, is uh, really progressing. The, uh, GNA per capita is also um, uh, progressing. Uh, the percentage of the population with a higher studies diploma is, is really, uh, really impressive. It's uh, 29%. And the unemployment rate is very, very, very low. Um, it's 4%, uh, uh, one of the lowest uh, in the European Union. Here. Uh, our uh, reasons to invest in Poland, this is highly educated workforce, um, ease of doing business, stable growth uh, prospects, and uh, we are a part of uh, United uh, Europe, uh, European Union common market. So when you invest in Poland, you have the access for the whole European Union. And uh, this is a thing that we, uh, is a very precious uh, uh, for us. And uh, here are some uh, estimations and uh, some quotations from uh, the World Media and the World Bank um, about the uh, uh, progress of, of that uh, my country has done uh, in the last years. And uh, I really um, am proud to represent uh, Poland. As I said, we are the one of the leading uh, markets in the terms of uh, economic uh, growth, and uh, we can be your good partner for uh, for entering into EU. And uh, there are my main sectors to invest in Poland. As I said, uh, the uh, main business uh, we, that we have with West Bengal, uh, at least for now, this is the coal business. Um, but uh, we are eyeing also on some other um, other sectors, and uh, you may hear uh, here you have the our the main sectors to invest in uh, in Poland. Um, <coughs> recently invested in Poland, this, uh, these these uh, world uh, wide companies, uh, and uh, you see that uh, we are attracting the FDI uh, quite efficiently. Yes, and uh, this is uh, the uh, satisfaction of, uh, of uh, investment in, in, uh, in Poland that 92% uh, of foreign investors are glad that they entered the Polish market. 
Uh, we are make, uh, trying to make it 100%, of course, and uh, we would like to uh, attract more investments uh, from, uh, from uh, India. So, as I said, I would be very short uh, because um, I, unfortunately my flight is uh, just uh, very, um, it's very close. Uh, but uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. I would like to quote also Swami Vivekananda that uh, we will not uh, stop until we reach the final goal. Thank you very much. May I request the President to please present His Excellency with a token of appreciation from our end. Our next speaker is Mr. Bernard Steinrucke, Director General, Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. In the context of what has been announced just a few minutes back, Mr. Steinrucke's address is very critical for us as a Chamber of Commerce. And I'm sure that, you know, after hearing him, we will, we will sort of be more clearer in our mind as to what is the path that both our organizations will take towards making true what we have announced, the special partnership between the two Chambers of Commerce. So, Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it seems all the special guests have disappeared, and I'm the only one who has to keep you alive before lunch. I'm trying to do that. I have 10 minutes. That's what I was given, I think. And so I will try to do my best. Um, of course, it's a great honor for me to be here uh, because the Bangalore Chamber of Commerce and Industry is uh, the oldest in India uh, and uh, older than Indo-German Chamber of Commerce older than the German Association of Chambers of Commerce and Industry, DIHK, as you mentioned, that is only 155 years old, even though in Germany we have one chamber that is 350 years old, that's the Hamburg Chamber of Commerce. But so I'm here in a room with uh, legacies, and that's a great honor for me. Of course, it was an honor to listen to Dr. Desai in the beginning. Uh, what was not mentioned is that his PhD from Cambridge, he got on a German topic. And he studied for two years at the university at the Institute of Weltwirtschaft in Kiel, in Germany. And after Calcutta, his second home from home from Delhi is Berlin, as he told me. So from that angle, and he is fluent in German. And so from that angle, I'm very grateful to have listened to you. A lot of things that you were saying, I'm absolutely agreeing to that. But I think one could have a day-long discussion on many of the topics, and I think that was really nice. Okay, speaking after the finance minister, of course, very difficult. He gave a big outlook. Speaking after the Polish ambassador is also very difficult because they've both covered a lot of topics uh, that I could now elaborate about, uh, which I won't do, but I will give you, or want to give you a few perspectives. Uh, just Poland. Poland, neighbor of Germany. We were talking about Bangladesh, neighbor of West Bengal and India. Very important to have good relations with the neighbors, no doubt about it. And Germany, I can tell you, has very good relations to Poland. Poland, with about 38 million people, little, little half of Germany, still we have a trade, a trade with Poland, just to imagine, where we export goods, last year 2017, value 64 billion US dollars. We exported to Poland, and they exported to us goods of 60 billion US dollars. So together, 124 billion US dollars trade. That's a number. If I were to give you the numbers for India, India and Germany last year had 12 million exports from Germany to India and 9.6 billion exports from India to Germany. So about 21 billion US dollars. And with Poland, 124. Those are numbers, which is quite significant. So I think we should do much more with India, definitely. And finance minister mentioned exports. And Indian leather, my good friend Calvani, who is in the room and who mentioned, he's basically exporting. He's a typical 
Mittelstand, a German, like a German Mittelstand, and his main market is Germany. And he is exporting to companies like Aldi, which is the ge largest German retailer, and these guys are cutthroat. Huh? One mistake, you're finished. The quality has to be persistent and always right. And he is managing it, and that's just one example. We were talking about, and we signed the MOU, especially to foster the Mittelstand in West Bengal. And indeed, German Mittelstand is the hardcore, the bone of the German exports and the German success. And when you know that Germany, when it comes to the export surplus, is by far the largest economy in the world, larger than the US, of course, anyway, because they don't have a surplus in the first place, but larger than China and many other countries. And Mr. Trump even says it's unfair that we have such a surplus. But that's basically because of the Mittelstand, because of the quality, and because we are export driven. Now, why are we export driven? Why is Germany so export driven? It's very simple. Germany was a country and still is a country of federal states. So we had in the history a lot of sort of small kingdoms. And these small states, if they wanted to survive, the companies had to produce way beyond their own state. Otherwise, they could not survive because not enough demand. So they basically started to produce more than they needed for their own state. And they started exporting. And to export to another country or another state, you have to be better than the companies in that state. Otherwise, why should they buy your stuff? And that is what really made Germany so successful. Because over centuries, we were fighting to be better than our neighboring states, to have better products and goods than they had. And for that, of course, innovation is critical. And when you look at one of the key criteria for the German SMSE success are the patents that they are launching. So many patents, even the smallest company is doing, even the smallest company is doing R&D. And what helps a lot, of course, it's all known, the German system of vocational training, where of each school leaving generation every year, more than 50% of the kids that are leaving the school are going through that vocational training where they basically, from day one after school, are getting a contract with the company. And the company is paying them a salary from day one, but still skilling them. These youngsters have no clue. They have only the school certificate. They have no idea of the real world. Still, the company is giving them a contract. They're employing them for three years. They're paying them a salary of which they can live on their own. And they're training them. And in these three years, the youngsters are learning theory in the schools and the practical part in the companies. They learn basically on the job. And as a consequence, they learn the real way. And as a consequence, they're able in their lifetime to produce quality made in Germany. And also as a consequence, many of these youngsters stay with the companies or some of them who go for higher education come back work for the companies, highly loyal, and the motivation with these SME companies is very high. And that system is another part of our, the German success story, as we call it. Now, coming back to India, um, West Bengal, of course, is a state, we heard it, very successful with good growth rates, very good growth rates over the average in India, but a lot of challenges. And when you look at the challenges, not only in West Bengal, but even in the whole of India. And just last Friday, I was in Delhi, and we had the summit with the Prime Minister on movement, on movement in India. And when two days prior, we had the Akma and Sai Manual Convention, the car industry, an extremely important industry for India, also for German companies in India. When you look what the German companies in India are primarily doing, more than 15, 16% is the automotive industry, either as suppliers or as OEM. So it will be critical, absolutely critical, where the automotive industry in India is going to head for. And therefore, the Akma and Saim Convention was very important, but also the summit organized by the Prime Minister and Niti Ayok was critical. And when you heard the Prime Minister speaking, how he is seeing the future of the Indian automotive industry, and generally, the question how and where the movement of people is going to head to, he made a statement. 
he gave the seven seas. You may have read it in the papers or some of you who were there. And I think that is quite interesting. And the seven seas, how the traffic, how the movement of people will look or has to look in future in India, it has to be common, connected, convenient, congestion-free, charged, clean, and cutting edge. Those were the seven Cs. And indeed, when we are looking at the mobility scenario in the world, be it Europe, be it America, you name it, we have huge challenges. And these huge challenges are traffic jams. These huge challenges are the environment. Huge challenges are, of course, where do we get the energy? Is the future still the combustion engine? Is it the electrical vehicle? Where are we going? It's highly confusing and highly difficult. And nobody knows the real answer. And the role of India is critical for the development of the world. We're not only talking about India, about West Bengal. Because today in India, we have about 24 cars per 1,000 people. In Germany, we have 650. In America, I think we have 700. Now, if India were to go the way that Europe or the US went, the world would be finished. India would be anyway finished. Because in India already, when you double the amount of cars, where should they go? It's impossible. You don't have the roads. You don't have the air, because the air is polluted already enough. You don't have the power, oil, gas, whatever. So. Unless in India we find new ways for movement of people and goods different from the ways we've been doing it in the developed world, we're finished. The world is even finished. Because with this kind of resources, nobody can cope. With this kind of pollution, nobody can cope. On the other hand, this gives India the great opportunity to look for new ways, to look for new ways of moving people to look for new ways how we plan the cities, to look for new ways how we transport our goods, etc. And I think there we have a golden opportunity. Together, we can find ways. And maybe Calcutta is a good example where we have to see how we transport people better. Because, I mean, I was lucky. Last night, my flight from Bombay was absolutely on time. In 20 minutes, I was in the hotel this morning. Strange enough, no traffic to come here, so everything was fine. But when I read the papers, how it was yesterday when it was raining, or when I read the papers about bridges falling and other things, difficult. So therefore, somewhere we have to find new ways, completely different ways, thinking out of the box, because this cannot be the future. And I can tell you, the seven C's of Prime Minister Modi are very good and apt, and we should follow them. But I have 20 ACs, unfortunately, on the reality of movement and traffic in India. And these 20 ACs four times are as follows. Complicated, complex, commotion, criminal, crowded, congested, crazy, chocker block, chaotic, challenging, costly, catastrophic, cancerous, capital locked, careless, confused, corrupt, conflict, collision, clocked, casualty, chase, cheat, circus, clutter, crash, crisis, collapse, conflict. So this is the reality. Now, this we have to change. And there, we need you. Because who else should change it? The people have to change it. We need your brains. We need your visions. And we need the youngsters. Because the youngsters, actually, they are the ones who will suffer most. And with them, we will have to develop ideas. That's why we have startups. We have a lot of startup initiatives also here in the chamber. We need brilliant ideas. And if in any state in India you have people with ideas, it's in West Bengal. And from that angle, I'm positive and hopeful that with the brilliant ideas, things will change. They've changed already quite a bit. Actually, I'm celebrating 25 years with India this year. I'm very proud to be that long associated with India. My first visits to Calcutta were indeed 25 years ago. I went to Calcutta, I came to Shantini Ketan. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And the most I love about West Bengal is the art, the artist. Interestingly enough, just yesterday, Jaisi Chakrabarti had a big exhibition in the 
Prince of Wales Museum in Mumbai. Unfortunately, I missed it because I was on the flight. But Jogan Chowdhury is another very good friend of mine. Sunil Das was one of my very good friends of mine here. So the art scene, very vibrant, West Bengal, very vivid. And maybe, therefore, we should take some ideas also from the artist. Today, for me, is a dry run. Because next week on Thursday is the AGM of the Indo-German Chamber of Commerce in Mumbai. You're all invited to please come, because now with our MOU, of course, you are all our friends. And by the way, you all have to join Indo-German Chamber of Commerce. I mean, it's very simple. It's very cheap. It's very reasonable. But we deliver fabulous, fabulous uh, services. So please join us next week on Thursday. Even though you're not a member, I still invite you already to come to Mumbai for the AGM. Because this time, our AGM, it's all about business and culture. And our German Minister for Culture and Media, she's the chief guest. She's going to come down. She's going to come down with the new head of the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. In the heart of the city of Berlin, they are building new museums, new opera houses for more than 2 billion euros, government money. Hard invested because Berlin wants to be one of the cultural center of the world. And I can tell you, culture is a good investment. And even in West Bengal, in Kolkata, they're trying to build a museum for contemporary art. Please support that also. Culture is really good. The second dry one is just next week, from the 18th to the 20th, your chief minister, Mamata Banerjee, is going to Germany. She will be accompanied by a big delegation of business people visiting Frankfurt. She will have various meetings. We are involved in organizing it. So those of you who accompany her, please do it. Look what Germany has to offer to you. It's great what they have to offer you. And your new president, Jit Sen, old friend of mine, he is the best example. He has a joint venture with Algaier, Mr. Hund, one of the prime German entrepreneurs, family-driven company, typical Mittelstand. But Mr. Hund is one of the best-known entrepreneurs in Germany. For decades, he's been the president of the Employers Association. He was the president of the chamber. He is still the president of the German-Austrian Chamber of Commerce in Vienna. He celebrates his 80th birthday this year, big party, Strong man going, and Chit is associated with him. I could not think of a better president for your chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. May I request Mr. Indrajit Sen, President-designate, to please conclude the session with a very small you know, vote of thanks. <coughs> <clears throat> I'm sorry, I must be holding you back for lunch, but anyway, I need to need to say thank you to uh, uh, to, to to all of you, and uh, so I need to say the honourable dignitaries on the dais, past president, distinguished guests from the consular court, uh, members of uh, members and invitees of the Bengal Chamber, members of media, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure. To, and privilege to be able to deliver a formal vote of thanks of the at the conclusion of the most special session of the chamber today. The annual general meeting brings two years together, one of which is one, uh, one in which your chamber has carried forward the mandate to uh, its multifarious roles and activities, and the year in which we, it will, this will work, not only and uh, continue, and not only that, and it will take it will be taken forward to a new horizon. It has been most fascinating session, and we had the opportunity of two finest economist, uh, my economic minds in, the, in our country here today. Our heartfelt thanks to Dr. Ashok Vidasai, and our sincerest gratitude to Dr. Amit Mitra, Honorable Minister of in Charge of Finance and Industry, uh, Commerce Enterprises, MSME Textiles, Government of West Bengal, for being with us this morning and enlightening us uh, with knowledge that is so essential for us to push through the current and complex realities confronting us. We are especially indebted to Dr. Mitra for sparing his time from his busy schedule, uh, for moderating this, uh, 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 for moderating the uh, initial uh, uh, program, initial uh, uh, session. And uh, may also take the uh, opportunity, Dr. Uh, Burakowski, of course, he has left, but we will uh, write to him saying thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, Poland, as you know, is also a very important country for West Bengal because they are also looking at various uh, activity, including 
the mining activity which is being uh, uh, going on uh, in West Bengal in particular segment. Uh, he was very kind. We met him in, in, in Delhi, and he was very kind to have agreed and accepted our request to come and address us here. Our deepest thank, of course, to my old friend, Bernard, Bernard Mr. Bernard Steinroke, Director General of India Chamber. And uh, uh, he was the one who, who was very kindly agreed to uh, give his consent to work together with the chamber. This, we think, is very important, very important, as uh, Dr. Uh, Mitra also mentioned, and uh, we also mentioned that it's very important for revitalization of the industrial scenario of West Bengal. And we thank Bernard for being here today. And thank you for the beautiful speech. Thank you so much. Uh, we would, uh, we are also uh, very, very thankful to uh, Mr. Alapon Bandhapadhyay, Mr. Alapon Bandhapadhyay, uh, IAS, Additional Chief Secretary, Department of Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises uh, of the Government of West Bengal, and uh, for honoring us by being the guiding light for our eclectic work in the most important area of transportation and MSME development. The Chamber is grateful that he could uh, share his unparalleled knowledge. Uh, listening to him has also been a great inspiration for all of us. Uh, if on the city and city's heritage, through his articles in the publication, this publication, which has been taken out by the Chamber, is truly one of the finest which we have taken out in the past. And uh, uh, I would now request uh, President uh, Chandra Shikhar Ghosh uh, to present our token of deep appreciation to Dr. Ashok Vidasai. <laughs> Mr. Bernard Steinruke. And Sri Alapun Bandhapadhyay. I think he has left already. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, may we now uh, re may we request you to please carry forward this motion with acclamation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for being such a patient audience. Uh, we are we have closed the morning session. Lunch is served. Third floor Bengal Lounge. Uh, we shall commence the business session very shortly in the next few minutes, maybe five to ten minutes. And uh, I would request the members of the managing committee uh, to stay back for that. Um, maybe, you know, if some of the members also wish to stay back and attend the business session, they're most welcome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for being with us. See you again in a few minutes' time. And lunch is on the third level Bengal Lounge. Please join us there. Yes, business session will be held here in the same, same hall.